Good morning, everyone. We will be beginning momentarily. We're going to give people just another minute or so to uh, get logged in, and then we'll be beginning. Thank you. All right, good morning and welcome to the 2020 Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. I'm Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president and CEO of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. And on behalf of our entire staff and our board of trustees, we're very glad you joined us. If you've attended this event in the past, you're well aware that this year's edition is quite different. Like so much in our society, we've had to adapt to the current circumstances. In fact, that's the theme for this year's event, wisdom, justice, adaptation. As you probably know, that's a play off the state's motto, and we believe adaptation is the right focus for this year's sessions. Speaking of those sessions, today is only the opening event. Over the next several weeks, we'll be back here on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. to explore the ways Georgians, their families, their businesses, and their government are adapting to a changed world. We'll cover the following areas, education, the budget, land use and transportation, the economy, housing, and healthcare. We have exciting panels of experts lined up for each of them, and we hope you'll be able to join us for as many of those as you can. We're grateful to be joined on this journey by some key sponsors without which our work would not be possible. They are our presenting sponsor, AT&T, and our platinum sponsors, Verizon and the Walton Family Foundation. We thank each of them for their support of this event. We're pleased to have been able to offer an outstanding lineup of speakers to you, our audience, at no charge. If you are so moved, however, we would appreciate your voluntary support as well. And you can visit www.georgiapolicy.org donate to make a tax deductible contribution. Uh, during this morning's program and the ones that follow, we would like to hear questions from you in the audience. You can submit those to us in the chat or the Q&A boxes on your screen. Just type your question there and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. Now, without further delay, it's my great honor to welcome our keynote speaker for this opening session, the U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Uh, Secretary DeVos uh, is uh, a little pressed for time this morning. And so I'm going to skip the, the most of uh, her bio here. I think she uh, is, is well known without that. The full agenda for this entire series, including full bios for her and the other speakers we'll have are available on our website, georgiapolicy.org. Um, so I'd like to just go ahead and launch right in. First, welcome uh, Madam Secretary virtually to Georgia. Thanks so much, Kyle. I really appreciate the opportunity to join you all, and uh, kudos to you for doing things differently. <laughs> well, we're, we're all doing what we can these days. That's right. Um, and, and so, you know, along those lines, let's just start by talking about the particular challenges uh, that 2020 has brought to education, not only in Georgia, not only in the United States, but all across the globe. Um, before we talk about this fall, I'd like to ask what you saw from educators this spring as they adapted to unforeseen circumstances and what you learned about education from that experience. Sure. Well, um, I think it goes without saying that uh, nobody was really prepared to uh, need to make the kind of pivots and uh, changes that all of us were forced to make really um, in mid-March this year. And uh, education and educators were certainly no different and students for that matter. Um, having to go from, uh, you know, full speed ahead in a, you know, fall, winter, spring semester into uh, something entirely different. And so it was, uh, I think it was very instructive for 
everyone involved in education, whether at the K-12 level or at the higher ed level, to be able to learn from one another and to share uh, share those learnings in real time. And I had, uh, I've had countless conversations with uh, school chiefs, with higher ed leaders, um, with governors, everyone really involved with trying to do the right thing on behalf of their students to talk about how to do that effectively and efficiently and quickly. And um, I, I think the the name of the, the game, so to speak, is, uh, is the fact that those who were really willing and able to embrace the, the need to change quickly uh, really, really fared quite well. And um, we saw particularly in higher education and you know, from what we did at the department, we immediately did everything we could to extend as much flexibility and autonomy to the states and local districts and higher ed institutions as much as we could under the laws and regulations that we're, uh, you know, we're directed to follow, uh, extending those to the states. And I think that was, I know that was very well received because uh, higher ed institutions were able to pivot very quickly. Many of them had online learning platforms already. And so their ability to quickly move into full-time distance online learning uh, was, was much, um, I think, much easier and more frictionless than it was for those at the K-12 level. And at the K-12 level, we saw uh, a lot of really hard work that went into trying to ensure that their students could continue learning. But we saw, frankly, a very uneven application of that. And, uh, and, and my hope is that there was a lot learned from those few months where the, uh, you know, the, the necessity was there. And in some cases, uh, the willingness to you know, do everything it took was there. In many cases, that was there. But in some cases, um, there was also a, sort of a, a propensity to give up quickly because it was so different and, and it was so unexpected. But that said, um, we are very much focused on doing everything we can do here to continue to encourage and urge states to do that next right thing for their students, to keep in mind who it is we're serving here and who it is we're helping to prepare. And that is you know, the current generation for future leadership in our nation. Sorry, I meant to unmute there, not stop my video. <laughs> so as, as we think about this fall, you've been very clear that you expect schools to reopen their doors to students. Um, and, and, you, and you talked a little bit about the experience this spring and, and you know, the, that you know, kind of honest assessment that it was an uneven and in many ways unsatisfying experience in the spring for many, many parts of the country. So um, to tell, tell us, you know, if, as, as schools do reopen their doors, or if at some point they have to revert to remote learning, you know, are, are there some specific things that you hope that they will carry from that spring experience and do better uh, this fall? Well, I think one of the, the real um, obvious learnings is that, uh, in, particularly in K-12 education, um, there has to be a much uh, larger posture around being nimble and flexible and ready to adapt based on current circumstances. And um, we've talked the last number of days about the importance of kids getting back in school. Uh, we know that this is not a matter of their health versus not health. It is really a matter of health versus health. We know that there are too many kids today who are uh, suffering because of the, the isolation and the distance from their peers and their teachers and having missed uh, several months of learning in some cases, in many cases. And we know that uh, there are many measures of a child's health. And as we think about uh, going into the fall, uh, it, it is imperative that kids get back into a routine and into a forward-leaning learning posture to continue to develop themselves. And we know especially for uh, kids from uh, vulnerable situations, from 
uh, low income backgrounds, those who don't have a lot of resources, we know that those are the ones that are the most negatively impacted by not having that school routine and that really uh, focus on continuing to move ahead and learn. And, and so um, I think, you know, also we, we talked about what, what, you know, some of my observations were, but I think it's, it's absolutely the case that today parents have a much clearer understanding of what their children's experience was this spring, uh, how they're, you know, they have a better perspective on how their particular school did with continuing to provide education opportunities. And, uh, and, and they're looking now for that leadership on the part of education leaders to ensure that their kids can go back to a forward movement and learning um, new material and with the expectation that uh, when we go back that there's going to be full-time uh, full learning, full-time operation, acknowledging that you know, if there's a, an area where there's a flare-up, um, there may need to be a pivot for a, you know, a, a period of time to a distance environment. But again, with that expectation that kids are back in school in routines and that schools are able to respond and react quickly to whatever the reality is in that particular area. Uh, we look across the country and uh, we know that in many, many, many communities and counties across the country, uh, frankly, they could go back today um, based on a, a lack of, uh, you know, having a lot of uh, infections in their, in, their, um, in their neighborhoods or in, in their communities. And so I, I think it's, it's really imperative for um, parents and education leaders to come together and talk about how we're going to continue to move into new routines, acknowledging what we've learned and what we have to be prepared for, but with a posture of we have got to keep moving ahead. Our kids, uh, our, our kids are counting on us to get this figured out. Right, right. Um, so a, a broader and and but consistent theme for from you as education secretary has been the need for Americans to engage in rethinking education. And, and as we think about adaptation, we want to think about things that don't just fit the current circumstances, but that can inform the way that we, we change uh, how we deliver these services going forward. So are there, are there any adaptations or innovations from this experience this year that you believe can carry over well beyond the pandemic? Well, I think there's one thing we've learned, um, you, pretty much everybody has learned, and that is uh, that technology really can be and should be an enhancement to education. And we can use technology in really important ways um, that maybe hadn't been anticipated or thought of before. Um, and when we think, when we don't look at technology as a threat, but really as a tool, uh, there's, there's really no end to the ways that uh, education leaders can think about how to enhance their, um, you know, their skills and their experience through the use of technology. Um, and I think also there's, there's been, I think, a new, um, a new realization that uh, there, there are other ways to measure uh, learning and education as, you know, as a thing um, instead of measuring the amount of time in a seat, uh, there are competency and mastery measures. So you're measuring what students are learning and achieving versus the amount of time spent somewhere. And, and we, we saw, you know, a lot of uh, that uh, deployed in, in the last few months in places where, uh, where there was already a, an orientation around uh, more distance and online learning. The, I think the experience of the student in that case, it has been um, the, it, the, the, positive, the positives around that have been, uh, I, I think, passed on uh, and shared with others much more broadly because uh, you know students 
you know, a, a younger elementary age student um, who is learning at a distance and is uh, sitting in front of a computer for several hours a day, um, that experience is not necessarily the most ideal one at a distance. Um, so all, all that to say, I think there are, there are different ways to um, embrace and use technology both in the classroom, but also in the need or necessity to pivot to a distance environment for whatever the reason might be or whatever the preference of the family might be. And um, that's, I, I think, one of the, one of the big um, learnings and, and the, you know, the lack of access that too many kids have to that. And so our, um, you know, our focus on needing to ensure that going forward, that is a, a priority for um, states and communities to ensure that you know, their students have that same kind of opportunity. Great. Well, and, and you talk about uh, families and, and uh, a broad theme from your work in education over the years has been the need for families to have choices. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a very important ruling on this topic in the case of Espinoza versus Montana. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that decision means for you. Well, it's a very significant decision. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with the case, um, the Espinoza case, Espinoza versus Montana, uh, was uh, brought forward by a number of parents in Montana that had uh, just ha had chosen to have their children in schools that were working for their children uh, through a tax credit scholarship program. And the Montana Supreme Court uh, really discontinued the program because some of these families were choosing to send their children to faith-based schools. And they said that that was unconstitutional under the Montana Constitution. The Supreme Court considered this and, um, and came down very much on the side of parents in this case and, uh, and, the, and the, um, the reality that uh, you cannot discriminate against a, uh, a school or another entity based on the fact that it is religious in nature. Um, and so the court was very clear. If you're going to have programs that give parents choices in education, then they have to be uh, they have to be open to any participant uh, and not discriminatory on the basis of of religion. So this has broad impl implications. It d relates directly to what's called a Blaine Amendment that 37 states have had, um, and it will uh, it will go after that particular um, prohibition or that particular impediment that many states have been citing in years past as a, uh, as a uh, you know, deterrent to expanding or offering uh, programs to empower parents to choose their child's educational setting. Uh, it has very broad implications, uh, very important implications, and um, I'm very encouraged that states that currently have programs, uh, they're only gonna be able to strengthen them more, add to them, and then states that have been uh, hesitant to go into that area uh, will no longer have that impediment or that perceived impediment to, uh, to you know, encumber them. Right, and as you, as you speak about states and, and choices, um, you know, there, there are some states, Georgia is one of them that has a, a few programs that offer choices for students and some states do not have those. So I wanted to talk about a, a federal proposal that's out there and that's the Education Freedom Scholarships proposal. Tell us how that would give new options to more families. Sure, well, and, and just to kind of uh, set the stage more broadly around this, we know that there are uh, many, many children today across our country that are uh, in schools that are simply not working for them, but they also, all too many of them, are in situations where they don't have any other choice. Uh, the, their family cannot move to a district where there's a better school, quote unquote, uh, or they cannot uh, find or, or you know, put together the tuition necessary to um, get into the school that their parents might uh, choose or wish for them. Uh, so there's, a, there's been a huge, huge impediment to all too many families, and um, and we've seen the detrimental impact of having kids stuck in places that are not working for them, 
and, uh, and, and you know, all too many of them giving up on their futures because it's either a, a mismatch where they are or they're simply not in an environment that is uh, one conducive to their growth and their uh, educational attainment and well-being. So um, the, the choice programs that have been uh, started in states across the country and there are increasing numbers of them and I, I'm encouraged to see more and more states uh, taking this on and offering these opportunities to families. But uh, we also know that in, in lots of places that there is a gr much greater demand than there is actual supply. And, uh, and so thinking about how do we fundamentally um, ensure that all kids have an opportunity to access a, an education that is going to help them grow and develop into everything they can be. Um, at the federal level, we don't wanna create a federal program. It's not the role of the federal government to be directly involved in any child's K-12 education, but we can, help, uh, we can help come alongside states and do so in a way that can enhance what states are already doing and provide them additional resources to expand what in almost every state that has a program is already, um, the, the demand exceeds uh, the supply. And in states where they haven't yet started a program, there's a, a real significant opportunity to do so uh, with funds that would be, would be uh, supplied through the form of a federal tax credit and those could be funds, they would be funds voluntarily contributed by individuals or businesses into a pool that would then be distributed to the states that want to participate. And um, we know that there, are, you know, most states uh, would not uh, deny this opportunity to kids and would see it as a huge uh, advantage to expanding the kinds of choices that we need today. And I like to encourage people to think broadly about the kinds of choices that could be offered. So most often when we, when we talk about school choice, we think about, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of catch words used like vouchers, tax credits, um, education savings accounts, and those are all mechanic charter schools. Those are all mechanisms to provide choices. But let's say uh, you're in a rural area and you have a very small community, a very small school, um, it's, it's not really practical to think that uh, with a school choice um, opportunity that you would see another two or three school buildings pop up in a community um, that already has a very small population to begin with. Rather, you might see the choice opportunity um, being manifest in giving kids in that particular community access to courses that they might not be able to take today because their school's too small to be able to do it. And they could you know, take a course online, uh, most likely from one of the finest instructors in the world and, uh, and could do so right in their own school building, their own school community. Or maybe there's a handful of kids in that school that learn very differently than what the pedagogy is in the school. And uh, there's no reason that a small micro school couldn't be formed up right there in that, you know, alongside, uh, you know, the one that, that already exists in the community for those kids who learn differently to be able to access their education in a way that works for them. Or perhaps you're in a, a region that has some very significant opportunities post 12th grade, post uh, secondary education that, um, that may be attract that don't require a four year degree, but may be very attractive to kids in high school already and may actually be able to prepare them to graduate high school and enter um, maybe a short term, uh, you know, six month or one year program and then go into a career or technical uh, role that is very exciting and, and full of opportunity for them. So there's, the, you know, these, these uh, scholarship funds could be used to help enhance that, uh, that particular um, track and, and, and perspective as well. 
So I, like, I really like to encourage folks to think very broadly about what providing choices and opportunity can mean and uh, do that in the context of, you know, we're, we're well into the 21st century and um, we look at how our world has changed in the last quarter century and how much is different than 25 years ago and yet how similarly we approach, especially K-12 education, to 25, 50, even 100 years ago. So it, it's time for us to introduce more uh, um, opportunities and more perspectives and more approaches to preparing young people to be everything they can be in their futures and to do so in a way that empowers families to make those choices and, and, and make those decisions on behalf of their, the kids that they know best. Thank you for that. And I know that uh, you had a last minute scheduling change this morning. We've got about five more minutes. Um, so we're gonna get to a couple of our audience questions here uh, quickly uh, before you have to go. Uh, I'll start with this one that we received, which is uh, many conservatives and education reformers have long advocated for assessments as a means to better inform parents and teachers on students' academic proficiency. It seems this is especially important considering we didn't assess students this past school year. Unfortunately, last month, the Georgia Department of Education announced they would be seeking a waiver from assessments for next school year, and many democratically-led states are quickly following our lead. Assuming you can't comment on a pending waiver, can you give us your view on assessments and their place in education, both from the federal perspective and how important they are to parents? Thanks for that question, Kyle. Um, I think you know measuring and assessing is very important uh, in, in multiple dimensions and in, in um, you know pretty much every area of life. And while we have given a waiver for assessments for this this past academic year. Um, I've you know, been on record multiple times urging states to consider some sort of a uh, you know, snapshot assessment when they come back to school this fall to understand where each of the, the students is. I mean, how much learning did they lose or did they not lose some learning? Uh, you know, where are each of these kids if they're going into fourth grade? Um, you know, we know that the transition from third to fourth grade is a critical one in terms of uh, students' ability to read and, uh, and their literacy level. So um, my, my orientation is, I, I, and, I, and I understand the uh, criticisms that have been launched over the years by both parents and um, educators around too many tests, and I, I'm certainly sensitive to that. But I do think, it, you know, knowing and measuring and understanding is, uh, is the only way we can then adjust and, and uh, fine tune for the future steps. And knowing what, uh, you know, where students are is, is a, of critical importance um, for everyone. And parents, I think, uh, know and understand this intuitively. Um, and at the same time, they know that uh, having a test every other week um, it, it isn't the answer, but there, there's a balance to be struck there, and it's an important one. Very good, and, and so one more question. Uh, it's been disheartening to see that much of the guidance from Georgia's Department of Ed to districts was that CARES Act funding be used to prop up the old system and fill budget gaps rather than to directly support students in the spring and over the summer. What is your view on how states utilize that money and, and how could any future funding support bill be crafted to more directly aid students? Well, again, I, you know, I am definitely a federalist and I know and understand the importance of the state and local communities role in uh, decision making around education. Uh, but I've, I've also, and we've as an administration also been very clear that um, this this spring clearly uh, unearthed a lot of realities about how uh, K-12 education has been experienced and how we have, uh, we have actually um, you know, accomplished it for a number of years or not in some cases. And it, it has helped to reveal what uh, deficiencies we have and where we need to do better or do things differently. And uh, my urging has been for 
educators at the local level to be very creative about how they use these funds to address address what the needs are based on uh, you know the, the the downstream implications of the virus and the pandemic and all of the closures uh, but to use these these funds creatively and in a way that is going to enhance uh, the educational experience for the student going forward and not to just do go back and do things the way we've you know continued to not not to keep doing things the way we've done them because that's the path of least resistance 